First, I'd like to begin by thanking our hosts. I was supposed to be here for the entire conference, and I apologize that I couldn't be due to circumstances beyond my control, but our hosts were very generous in shifting my time from the talk to the very last day. I arrived yesterday uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon to Tarun, and I have to catch a flight tomorrow at 6 o'clock in the morning from Warsaw. So I appreciate the indulgence in still allowing me to speak. Um, I remember the conference from, uh, what, four years ago, I think, which was so wonderful. I wanted so much to be here, and I apologize that I couldn't. So in pursuing the theme of the conference, Aquinas and the Church Fathers, I'm interested in the sources for Aquinas' definition of misericordia, given in question 30 of the second part of the second part of the Summa. Misericordia is compassion in our heart at the misery of someone else by which we are compelled to help if we can. Aquinas himself identifies the immediate source for this definition as St. Augustine in De Civitate Dei 9.5. However, looking at its sources more deeply in the Church Fathers is important because of the way in which the definition partially employs compassion or compassio to define misericordia. In the first place, because compassio and compatior are terms that are not found in pagan Latin sources. And in the second place, because pagan Latin sources meant something quite different by misericordia than do either Augustine or Aquinas, something that excludes the role of what we consider to be compassion. I will suggest that the element of compassion that Aquinas has in mind in discussing the virtue of misericordia renders the possessor of that virtue the most Christ-like in relation to other human beings. So the aspect of the definition of misericordia of concern here is the element of compassio. Misericordia involves compassion in our heart for someone else that compels us to assist, if we can, those who suffer. In giving this definition, Augustine was concerned to distinguish the Christian attitude towards suffering from the Stoic. The Stoic will not allow the suffering of another to affect him as a passion upon the occasion of someone else's suffering. That assertion about the Stoic does not imply that he will not experience a passion upon seeing someone else suffer, but like all the unruly passions that occur in one's life, caused by objects and events in the world over which one has no control, the Stoic sage should and will practice apatheia toward the passion. That is, he will be indifferent to it. In addition, the suffering of another may, of course, be an occasion for him to act benevolently toward the one who suffers, a benevolent act guided by the natural law and considerations of justice. However, misericordia is a com is uh, sorry misericordia is a common term in pagan Latin sources, and it was ambiguous in its use between referring to a passion and referring to an action. In its use, referring to a passion, insofar as misericordia involves the suffering upon the occasion of someone else suffering, it is explicitly condemned as a vice of the mind by Cicero and compared to the weeping of wretched and old women by Seneca, who also mocks a friend who grieves for his dead child. In De Civitate Dei, Augustine was highly critical of this stoic abuse of misericordia, considered as a passion. He relates a story of a shipwreck and a stoic on board who was concerned about losing the ship. Discussing the Stoic, Augustine writes derisively, it is the habit of the Stoics to find fault with misericordia. But how great the honor of this Stoic that I have spoken of would have been had he been so disturbed by misericordia to have freed a broken human being from affliction and to have feared a shipwreck. Where the Stoic might be benevolent towards those who suffer, According to Augustine, one should, one should and will be compassionate and merciful. The good man suffers with those who suffer, and prompted by that suffering, acts to alleviate that suffering if he can. Thus, for Augustine, misericordia goes beyond the simple compassion that the Stoics criticize and abuse, goes beyond that compassion insofar as it prompts action. As a passion simply, compassion is directed at others who suffer one who suffers because they suffer. A comparison of Stoic clemencia, or clemency, and Augustinian misericordia is useful here. 
Clemencia bears upon punishment. It mitigates or lessens the amount of a punishment that is otherwise justly imposed. In his letter to Nero de Clemencia, Seneca urges the emperor to exercise clemency in his imposition of punishments. It's precisely in that context that Seneca abuses misericordia, suggesting that nothing could be further from the tears of wretched and old women, of wretched and old women, and Augustinian compassion. However, there is in Tertullian as well evidence for this second sense of compassion associated with Augustine. Most of Tertullian's other uses of the terms, compassio or compatior, have to do either with a discussion of the relationship of the soul to the body, in which the soul is affected along with the body, or the Trinitarian question, whether the father suffers but the son, during the crucifixion, to which Tertullian answers, no. In none of these uses, including the commentary of Paul, is there any mention of misericordia, as there is in Augustine. However, one important use that, while not mentioned along with misericordia, is significantly different from the compassion directed to Christ, and more akin to the sense it has in Augustine, is found in Tertullian's work on modesty. There, Tertullian discusses those Christians who have engaged in fornication and adultery, who are separated from the church. He's arguing against what he takes to be a lax attitude of some bishops, who think they can forgive the sin on their own and admit the sinners to communion, without true repentance on the part of the sinner before God, who truly forgives. For Tertullian, these sinners do not receive forgiveness from the church and full communion despite the lax bishops, but remain outside the church until they truly repent before God. Remaining thus out of communion with the members of the church, Tertullian suggests that they possess something greater than the false communion, communion given them by the bishops namely the compassion of the members of the church. In other words, those who are outside the church because of their grievous sin are surely suffering, but those who are within the church have compassion for them, that is, they suffer with them. This compassion is different from the compassion by which one unites one's own sufferings to Christ. In this compassion, the direction of fit is the opposite, as one apprehends the suffering of another, and one joins oneself to that suffering. Still, there's no mention of misericordia. So it appears that compassio and compatior are originally introduced into Latin without any reference to misericordia. The first occurrence of the term compassio or compatior in proximity to misericordia in extant Latin texts takes place in the work of another North African, Cyprian of Carthage, and in a context very much like the one we have just seen in Tertullian. Cyprian also uses the term compassion in the first sense discussed above. In one work, Ad Quirinum, collecting passages commonly used in dispute with Jews, Sim Syrian simply quotes in Latin translation the Greek of Romans 8.13. His, com um, I'm going to skip the reading now, but his compatiamur is again simply the word used to translate Paul's sympasco. The Latin throughout is close to Tertullian's, but almost a precise match on the translation of Paul's Greek, except for the use of the subjunctive, compatiamur, where Tertullian had the indicative, compatimur. Syrian does not mention uh, misericordia here any more than had Tertullian. Again, sorry, not Syrian, Cyprian. Again, Cyprian provides the same quotation word for word in his letter Ad Fortunatum in an effort to provide passages from scripture that will encourage the faithful to prepare for martyrdom and not turn away from it. Cyprian himself will be martyred in the year 258. However, in this second passage, there's a mention of misericordia, although not in direct relation to or commentary in the quotation from Romans 8.13. Instead, it is a quotation of Romans 12.1 for the same purpose, namely, to encourage Christians under persecution to be prepared for the worst, for the sake of God. Oro ergo vos, fratres, per misericordiam dei ut constituatis corpora vestra, hostiam viva, sanctum placentum deo. Therefore I pray for you, brothers, that through the misericordia of God, you may offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. In short, God's misericordia will prepare you for the trial that awaits you. However, even though compatiamur and misericordia occur in close proximity to one another in these quotations that Cyprian has assembled, 
There's no relationship between the two notions signified by the terms. And the direction of the fit of the compassion referred to in 8.13 is still from one's own suffering to Christ. However, there's a third text from Cyprian that is significantly different in its use of compatio. It is to be found in his 17th epistle to his brethren among the people, the Christian brethren who held fast to the faith under persecution. The context is parallel to, but not the same as the one we have just seen in Tertullian, where Tertullian was concerned with those Christians who had separated themselves from communion through the grave sins of fornication or adultery. Cyprian is concerned to address the issue of those brethren who did not hold fast, but apostatized under persecution. He portrays the state of apostasy as a kind of suffering. Here he quotes St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Si patitur membrum unum, con patiuntur et cetera membrum. If one member suffers, so also the other members suffer with him. Then in his own voice, Cyprian adds, Compatior ego condoleo fratribus nostris quilapsis et persecutionis infestatione prostrati partem nostrorum viserum se cum trahentes parum dolorum nobis suis vulneribus intulerant. I am compassionate and grieve for our brothers who have lapsed and fallen prostrate under the infestation of persecution and have inflicted a similar grief upon us to their wounds, as if taking away with them a part of our guts. Cyprian is describing a kind of double compassion here. First, as a member of the church, he recognizes the suffering of and is compassionate towards those who have apostatized. Second, as a leader of the church, he also recognizes the suffering and, com and is compassionate for those who did, who did not apostatize, but grieve in compassion for the loss of their brethren. Immediately upon expressing this compassion for the unfaithful apostates, Cyprian adds, to whom the divine misericordia is able to give healing. Thus, there is here in Cyprian an association of compassion with misericordia understood as forgiveness and healing. However, it's important to note that those who experience the compassion are not thereby called to express misericordia. The misericordia is expressed by God alone, since presumably the suffering is the suffering of sin, and only God can forgive sin. Indeed, Cyprian goes on to chastise presbyters whom he has heard disregard the pleas of the martyrs and instructions of the bishops by prematurely holding company with the apostates. So in Cyprian, with respect to apostasy, there's an association of suffering that calls for compassion and misericordia that relieves it without it being the case that the one who experiences compassion is the one who acts according to misericordia to alleviate the suffering. Compassio is one thing, misericordia, something quite different. Compassion will not be associated again with misericordia for another 150 years until St. Ambrose's very late work, De Nabute Jezraelita, written in 394, just three years before Ambrose's death. However, the association that Ambrose establishes between compassion and misericordia is significant for our investigation. Writing on the story of Naboth from the Book of Kings, Ambrose is urging his listeners or readers to avoid storing up riches, but rather to give to the poor without judging the poor to be cursed by God or undeserving. Pointing out that if anyone is cursed by God in scripture, it is the rich, not the poor. Ambrose writes that in any case, that does not matter. For misericordia is not in the habit of judging merit, but of giving assistance in necessities, of serving the poor, not investigating justice. For as scripture says, blessed is the one who understands the destitute and poor. Ambrose then immediately specifies who it is that understands the destitute and poor, and provides this misericordia to them. He writes, who then is it who understands? The one who is compassionate to him, who faces him as a natural friend, who recognizes that the Lord made both the rich and the poor, who knows that he will sanctify his fruits if he will deliver some portion of them to the poor. Here at last we have compassion and misericordia existing in the same subject. 
Misericordia presupposes compassion because compassion involves a recognition and understanding that those who are poor and destitute are our friends by nature. I'll return to that point perhaps depending on how I'm doing in time in terms of talking about Aquinas at the end. Right now, however, I want to point out another significant element of this passage in Ambrose, and that is the, disso the dissociation of misericordia from justice. Ambrose says that misericordia does not inquire into justice, non examinare justitia. In the Roman world, this use of misericordia dissociated from justice is striking. I said above that misericordia had ambiguous uses among the pagan Latins. First, there was the misericordia condemned by the, Sto by the Stoics. This sense of misericordia can be thought of in relation to, to the second sense of compassion in the Christians Tertullian, Cyprian, and Ambrose earlier. Directed, not, sorry, sorry, I'm, I was skipping a line there and I messed that up. This sense of misericordia that um, uh, Ambrose has enunciated can be thought of in relation to the second sense of compassio in the Christians Tertullian, Cyprian, and Ambrose, directed not at Christ, but at those amongst us whom one finds oneself, at those amongst whom one finds oneself. I'm sorry. Cicero and Seneca would condemn this compassion as a form of the vice misericordia. The other sense of misericordia is that of a judge or emperor mitigating punishment. Cicero flatters Caesar's misericordia, his well-known reputation for either limiting the punishment of his enemies or forgiving it after his, it has been imposed. Cicero uses it in this different way in the hopes of getting Caesar to forgive the banishment of the rebel Ligarius. Some would suggest that this misericordia was part of the growing resentment of the Roman Senate toward Julius because it smacked of the vanity of an emperor toward his subjects. This limitation or mitigation of punishment is what Seneca will later call clemencia, and urge upon Nero, avoiding the earlier equivocal uses of misericordia by Cicero. This misericordia, understood as clemency, characterizes someone in authority who stands in judgment over another, with the power to punish or release from punishment with the authority to forgive an offense or to hold the offender fast to the claims of punishment and suffering that is justly deserved. Looking back at Tertullian and Cyprian, the power they attribute to God alone to forgive in relation to the fornicators, adulterers, and apostates looks like this Ciceronian and Roman sense of misericordia, the character of a judge who releases from the demands of justice or honor. We, the offender's fellow Christians, may experience compassion for our separated brethren, but only God can restore them to the community by forgiving their offense. In that context, God is not portrayed as experiencing compassion for the malefactor. However, Ambrose has introduced a new sense of misericordia that is not the misericordia of a judge or an emperor. It's the misericordia of a friend who does not stand in judgment of his natural friends, but moved by compassion for them, acts to assist them in their poverty and destitution. This is not misericordia as judgment, but misericordia as aid or assistance. Given Ambrose's influence upon Augustine, it is not unreasonable to suggest that Augustine would have been influenced by him in his understanding of misericordia as characteristic of a Christian directed towards those who are poor and destitute. What Augustine's definition of misericordia given in the City of God does and subsequently adopted by Aquinas, is expand the scope of Ambrose's notion beyond the confines of the poor and destitute to suffering as such. Misericordia is compassion in our heart at the misery of someone else, by which we are compelled to help if we can. Turning then to, how am I doing, Father? On time. Yes. Oh. Five. <laughs> so I, I, this is the. Turning then to Aquinas, like Tertullian and Cyprian, he also comments on Romans 8.17. Like Tertullian, he interprets Paul in much the same way, with a similar Stoic resonance, writing that we will receive the inheritance of glory if, simo cum Christo patienter sustenemos tribulationes huius mundi. That is, if along with Christ we bear the tribulations of this world patiently. The comment is brief, and passes quickly to the next verse in Romans as if Thomas has very little to say about it. 
Still, despite its terse character, Aquinas' commentary on this passage in Paul can be said to express what I've called Tertullian compassion. If one suffers, one ought to relate one's own suffering to that of Christ, bear it patiently, and one will receive an eternal reward for doing. The only qualification I would make to the claim relating Aquinas to Tertullian and Cyprian is that Aquinas' text does not actually use the term compassio in relating one's sufferings to Christ. The passage simply says to bear one's suffering patiently. Things are quite different, however, in Aquinas' discussion of misericordia, where we find Augustine's definition of misericordia involving compassion. Aquinas is not simply content to accept the sense of compassion from Augustine, where the compassion appears prior to that act that it prompts. Aquinas' understanding of Augustinian compassion has to be set within the larger context of his earlier discussion of love as a passion and the distinction between sensitive and rational appetite. Love can be understood in two ways as a passion. Most immediately, it can be understood as a passion of the sensitive appetite being affected by some desirable sense object. As a passion of the sensitive appetite, it is, of course, a bodily passion. By analogy, however, the will can be said to be moved by an intelligible good that is understood, and thus to suffer a passion for that intelligible good. So moved by the intelligible good, love expressed in the will can be said to be a passion. So for, for Aquinas, compassion, compassion can be understood with respect to the sensitive appetite and the rational appetite. In the sensitive appetite, it may literally involve bodily pain particularly in and around the heart. Here, however, Aquinas makes a crucial point. The act of assisting the one who suffers is not praiseworthy if it proceeds from the compassion of the sensitive appetite. That is, proceeds from or is prompted by the bodily pain or anguish experiences at the sight of suffering. If it simply proceeded from that bodily passion and nothing more, it would not even be a human act. To be a genuine human act to, and to be praised, the act of misericordia must proceed from the compassion of the will. If the act is prompted by the compassion of rational appetite, that is, by love in the second sense, then Aquinas argues the act that follows that love is praiseworthy. This compassion is also Christ-like, indeed perhaps more Christ-like than Tertullian's and Cyprian's compassion that begins with one's own suffering and identifies it with the passion of Christ. In fact, Aquinas understands the compassion involved in misericordia to be an actual rejection of Stoicism. Commenting on John 11, 1 through 44, where Christ raises Lazarus from the dead, but first weeps in anguish for Lazarus, uh, referring to our friend, as well as comforts the suffering Mary and Martha, Aquinas argues that Christ is teaching against the Stoics. He actually says teaching against the Stoics that weeping at the loss of a friend is rational and the expression of a virtue. As a bodily passion of the sensitive appetite, weeping is a sign of the passion of rational appetite, the will. That is one's compassionate love for the other. From that love of his friend that prompts his tears, Christ then acts from the love to raise Lazarus from the dead. Finally, keep in mind the element of friendship in the story of Christ and Lazarus. We saw that Ambrose related compassion and misericordia to natural friendship for the poor and destitute. Although Augustine does not mention friendship, he broadens the scope of compassion and misericordia from the poor and destitute to those in general who suffer. Aquinas, operating with Augustine's definition, will, however, relate compassion and misericordia to friendship, indeed natural friendship. When Aquinas analyzes misericordia, he distinguishes two different forms. Both involve a kind of union with the other who suffers. One involves a union brought about by the recognition that the one who suffers is very much like oneself and the judgment that a similar suffering might befall oneself. This form Aquinas associates with the Greek notion of eleos, particularly as it is analyzed in Aristotle. This eleotic misericordia is in a way self-directed, since one turns from the suffering of the other toward the fear of such suffering befalling oneself, and we can associate the act of misericordia that seeks to alleviate the suffering prompted by this eleos with the maxim, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. 
If you were in such a state of suffering, you would like some help, so you should help now. Insofar as the act of misericordia here would be prompted by a prior compassion, a compassion that is driven by a recognition that the one suffering is very much like oneself, and a subsequent fear for oneself, such an act of misericordia would not be praiseworthy, however much it assisted the one suffering. The other form of misericordia, Aquinas relates to Aristotle's discussion of sonalgain, the act of grieving with a friend who grieves. Recall that Seneca had mocked the grief of a friend, whose grief for his dead son Seneca thought overwrought. The union involved in this form of misericordia, Aquinas explains, is the union brought about by love, the love of friendship, whereby a friend makes the good and the suffering of his friend his own. Here we can think of the great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. In this case, the compassion that consists in grieving with a friend is clearly chosen as a result of the union of love, and thus, as we have seen for Aquinas, praiseworthy. For Aquinas, such chosen compassion can be a sign of the depth of the love and um, a passion that makes the act of misericordia more efficacious. Finally, I've argued at length elsewhere that this form of misericordia has to be understood in the light of Aquinas' discussion of natural friendship and the story of the Good Samaritan, in which we are taught that our neighbor is any anthropos, any homo, any human being who suffers. To conclude, I hope to, here to have suggested how Aquinas' discussion of misericordia and the compassion that is integral to it is related to several of the Church Fathers, explicitly in the case of St. Augustine and implicitly in the cases of Tertullian and Cyprian, to whom we owe what we may call the invention of compassion in the West, at least on the purely human side. But perhaps more importantly, Aquinas' relation to St. Ambrose, to whom we appear to owe the uniting of compassion to misericordia in the same subject of action. The thematizing of a Christ-like, passionate assistance that comes to the aid of one's natural friends, anyone who suffers, whom one encounters along the way. Thank you.